Uh, good morning. My name is John Jeffries. Um, welcome to the class of 2010. You've met Susan Palmer, the Dean of Admissions. There are a couple of other people here you might uh, want to know. Martha Ballinger, will you identify yourself? Martha is the Dean of Students, and uh, most of you will sail through without uh, mishap or concern, but if you should have an accident or have problems figuring something out, Martha will be a wonderful resource, as will be your peer advisors. Uh, Yara Gedichu in the back is uh, involved in our public service center, and that will be a place that many of you wish to spend time. And there are others whom I also probably should introduce. The law school staff is uh, eager for your arrival. Susan tells me there are 363 of you from 129 undergraduate institutions representing 40 states and a number of foreign countries. 19% of you choose to identify yourselves as members of racial or ethnic minorities. 40% of you are women, uh, which closely approximates the number of women in the application pool. I should perhaps mention, we do, in selecting you, in selecting a class, we do take into account racial and ethnic diversity as a goal. We do not try to monitor our classes for the numbers of men and women. We just follow that take the best people and see how it falls out. Typically, there are usually more men applicants than women applicants, and that number bounces around a little bit between 40 and 50 percent. And you are very, very good academically. You are the most qualified class ever to enroll in the history of the law school. This part of this of the building in which you now sit is uh, a fairly early part of buildings begun in the 1970s. Uh, it would be hard for you to reconstruct without a guide exactly where that building leaves off and another begins because the old buildings have been completely renovated, there's been new construction, and there has been uh, an effort to tie them all together into what you now see as the Harrison Law Grounds. That effort took 10 years and $50 million. It produced what I believe to be the best physical facility for the study of law in the nation. And you will see that we did not stent on the elegance or availability of student space. And you should know that the Law Grounds Project was not funded by the Commonwealth of Virginia. It was paid for by contributions from our alumni, money they gave as an investment in your future. And they continue to invest in your future, even the high tuition costs with which I know you are familiar. <laughs> do not begin to cover the actual cost of education at the law school. Each year, approximately one-third of all the dollars we spend, think of that as a 50-cent match on every tuition dollar, is provided by our alumni. Last year, over 50% of our graduates gave to the law school. For the second year in a row, it is my belief that is the highest particip participation rate of any law school in the nation. Those people give because they had a great experience when they were here and because they want you to have a great experience as well. They are committed to your success. My principal task this morning is the introduction of our guest speaker, Louise Sams, about whom more shortly. But let me take a few minutes to talk about the academic enterprise on which you now embark. The first law school dean whom I knew personally was a man named Hardy Cross Dillard. An impressive guy with a wonderful voice, and he would bring all the first-year students in, much smaller number in those days back in the late 1960s, and he'd walk up to the podium and say, welcome to the last of the learned professions. Well, a lot has changed since Hardy's day. He was, by the way, a legendary teacher. People 30, 40 years out of law school still remember things from his class a dean of the law school in the 1960s, and subsequently a judge on the world court. A lot of things have changed since Hardy was dean. In those days, students studied law and law and more law, and today you will study law and a lot more. Members of this faculty have advanced degrees, chiefly in history, economics, psychology, philosophy, and those disciplines now inform and enrich the study of law. Yet for those changes in the nature of what we study, it remains true today as it was 50 years ago that law is a learned profession. You will and you can learn throughout your careers, but you begin here today a three-year program 
devoted exclusively to that purpose. You will learn to research the law, to find the statutes, the judicial decisions, the administrative agency regulations, the executive orders, the academic analysis that you need, and what is harder to know when you found it. You will learn to argue, not merely to dispute or to disagree, but to persuade. There's a world of difference. Nothing in the practice of law requires that you be disputatious or disagreeable. On the contrary, good lawyers, even when they are involved in litigation, are constantly seeking agreement. And to find that agreement, you must learn to argue in this sense. That is, to present your case clearly to craft an argument that persuades others to your point of view, that structures their understanding so that they begin to see the issue in your terms. And most of all, you will learn to reason, and to reason with that clarity, dignity, and integrity that we call thinking like a lawyer. That phrase has been around as long as lawyers have been, thinking like a lawyer. And although to my knowledge, no one has ever defined it successfully. I promise you, in a year, you will understand its meaning, and you will be changed irrevocably and forever by your capacity to think like a lawyer. Research, argument, reason, these are intellectual tasks, and the skills required to perform them are intellectual skills, and the training to produce those skills is intellectual training. Laypersons, which until just five minutes ago included you, <laughs> tend to think of legal rules as things, hard and fast, solid and unanswerable, like, like stones or bricks. They assume that the lawyer's job is to go to some repository of rules, some place where this information is kept, like a book of statutes or a collection of judicial decisions, look up the problem, find the right rule, plunk it down, there you have an answer, yes or no. Nothing could be farther from the truth. To a lawyer, legal rules and doctrines are not like bricks, they're tools. They are like the specialized instruments that a surgeon or a sculptor or a shipbuilder might use in his or her trade. But the tools of the law are not, are not physical objects, they are abstractions, generalizations, propositions expressed in words. Those words invite interpretation, and they require understanding. The tools of the law are not grasped with the hand, but with the mind. They are not powered by muscle and sinew, but by analysis and reason. They operate not in the physical environment of blade against flesh or chisel against stone, but in the intellectual arena of Rule against rule, argument against argument, idea against idea. Proficiency with those tools requires that you become a scholar of the law, whether you end up in litigation or business practice or domestic relations or government service, you first must become a scholar of the law. Whether you commit yourself to public interest or to paying clients, you must become a scholar of the law. Whether you end up representing banks or burglars, labor or management, captains of industry and migrant farm workers, you will do that only if you are a scholar of the law. That's your obligation here as students and it is your opportunity. And from where I sit, what a glorious opportunity it is. You have the chance to study law at a wonderful facility with generous spaces adapted to every need. You have the chance to study with an outstanding faculty. They're smart. They're productive, they're learned, they're accomplished, they're well-known, and they have not forgotten that the first duty of a teacher is to teach. In the combination of scholarly reputation and classroom dedication, I think they're the best faculty in the country. And what is equally important, you have the opportunity to learn from one another, from classmates of diverse backgrounds, exceptional abilities, who come together here in a community of civility and trust for a common purpose. Brian said this, and it's absolutely right. You will come to know and cherish each other, and the community that you here begin to constitute, as much as you will value what you learn. Now you embark on an exciting journey 
on behalf of the faculty and of the great community of Virginia alumni, of which you will someday be a part, let me welcome you to the last of the learned professions. Of course, to say that a law is a learned profession is to say not only that it's an intellectual and scholarly endeavor, which it is in part, but also that it's a profession and not merely a job, that the practice of law is concerned with the public good as well as with private gain, and that lawyers have public responsibilities and obligations as well as private opportunities. I thought the introduction to that might well come from a graduate of the law school and to introduce you to the legal profession from the perspective of an alumna. We have a woman of remarkable achievement, Louise Sams, graduated from the law school in 1985. She went to work for the firm of White and Case in New York City, representing both domestic and international clients in business matters, chiefly acquisitions, mergers, joint ventures, and securities offerings related to those events. In 1993, Louise joined Turner Broadcasting System, which some of you will know under its initials TBS, where she is now Executive Vice President and General Counsel, obviously one of the most important positions in media and entertainment law. She is also now the President of TBS International, and some sense of the uh, obligations of that job can be gathered from following her for the last week. She began this last week in, uh, with meetings in London, went directly from London to Hong Kong, uh, flew back from Hong Kong, which I guess is about 15 hours, to San Francisco, then did a red eye back to Atlanta, spent one night at home before coming up here to speak to you. And finally, as some of you will likely know, Louise, I think there are eight Princetonians in this group, uh, Louise sits on the Board of Trustees of Princeton University. Please welcome Louise Sams. <laughs>